There is a lot of confusion among believers concerning faith. Many people suppose that faith is something that people vocalize, articulate. They talk about it. They say they believe in Jesus, therefore they are saved. No one can question that. It does not matter how they live or what they do, as long as they say they believe. To them, faith is something that people proclaim. It is a declaration. It is a proclamation. I believe in Jesus. I am saved. Unfortunately, it is not that simple. Faith is not something that is vocalized or articulated. It is something that is lived. In John 15, Jesus said that we must abide in him and his word must abide in us. There is a responsibility on our part. James said that faith is proved by action. It is not proved by words. Faith is not a collection of statements that prove what a person believes. It has to be proven because anybody can say the right thing. They can fool people. How is faith proven? Only one way. By people's behavior. What they do. How they live. If a person says he believes, says he is saved, but continue to live in sin, enjoying sins in his life, he is lying, James says in the Bible. He is deceived. An old preacher once said, I used to know his name, but I'm an old preacher and I forgot his name. But anyway, what he said is important. He said, a faith that cannot change your behavior will not change your destiny. It is true. If what you say you believe is not changing the way you live, you believe the wrong thing. It will not bring you to heaven. For instance, you are sitting in a movie theater, you are enjoying the show. All of a sudden, the manager runs on the stage and he says, you need to evacuate, there is a bomb in the theater. But he is calm, he's smiling, he's not moving, he's not running. Would you believe him? He may declare that there is a bomb in the theater, but he does not believe it. His action proved that there is no bomb in the theater. But if the same manager rushes on the stage and makes the same statement, but he runs off the stage and he takes off like a crazy man, would you believe him? You better believe him, there's a bomb in the theater. But if someone tells you that he believes in Jesus, tells you that he is saved, but his life does not prove it, he lives in sin, he lives like an unbeliever, he is an unbeliever. He is not abiding in Jesus, and the word is not abiding in him. Truth and true faith is easy to recognize. It is always accompanied by works, James says. It makes people do what they say they believe. This morning, we will cover the story of a woman who proved her faith by doing things that corresponded to what she said. 
Today we continue with the story of Rahab. Please turn to Joshua chapter 2. Our story today is of a woman from the Old Testament. She was a lost pagan woman who lived in the city of Jericho. And yet she became one of the most honored women in the Bible. Her name is Rahab. She is honored in the Bible twice. First in Hebrew 11, she is an example of faith. And then in James chapter 2:25, she is an illustration of works. Putting the two together, we see in that woman, Rahab, the picture of what we should all have, a faith that produce works. A faith that is easily proven. Faith without works is dead, we are told in the Bible. She was a Moabitess, and she became the mother of Boaz. If you remember in Ruth chapter 4, the nearer kinsman redeemer refused to redeem Ruth because she was a Moabitess. He did not want to contaminate his family tree by introducing Moabite blood into his line. Boaz had no such concern. His lineage had already been contaminated. His mother was Rahab, a prostitute from the city of Jericho, and that made no difference to God. Rahab's faith blot out her past, so much so that Rahab actually became an ancestress, is that the right word? Ancestor, ancestress of Jesus in Matthew 1, 5. The Messianic line ran directly through Rahab, to Boaz, to David, to Jesus. But if you look closely at that genealogy, you will see that it is really the genealogy of Joseph. He was not really the father of Jesus. None of his seed, none of his blood entered into Mary. She was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. So there is no problem with Moabite blood contamination. Now, in 1955, a lady by the name of Edith Dean wrote a book called All the Women in the Bible. I got that book. In it, she says that the Rahab in Matthew 1.5 is not the same Rahab as the harlot in Joshua. She might be offended by a prostitute in the genealogy of Jesus, but the two are indeed one and the same. Be careful with all the supposedly Christian books that are for sale nowadays. They are not all accurate. Now, the NIV version of the Bible does not like the word prostitute. They suggest that she was an innkeeper. Sounds better. <laughs> but she was not an innkeeper. She was a harlot. She was a prostitute. And God is not offended by that. And neither should you. We are going to see four things about Rahab. First, we're going to see her conviction. Then we're going to see her conversion. Number three, we're going to see her confidence. And finally, we're going to see her converts. So let's start with Rahab's conviction. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Akisha Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab, and they lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. 
So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan, to the fords, and as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. So in preparation for the invasion of the city of Jericho, Joshua sent out two spies. This was not a sign of a lack of faith on his part. It was a military strategy. Then the spies found shelter in the house of a harlot named Rahab, verse 1. Entering the house of such a person would not arouse suspicion. Men went in and out of that house all the time. Somehow the king was told that some of the men of Israel had entered the house of that woman, in verse 2. When the messengers from the king asked Rahab where the spies were, she told them that they had already left the city in verse 5. She lied to the king. Is it right to lie? No. The Bible tells us that lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. But when a life is at stake, God wants the life to be saved. Plus, at this point, Rahab was an unbeliever. She was a pagan. She was a member of a degenerate, immoral race. One of the main deities of Canaan was Ashtoreth, the goddess of sensual love. So as a common woman of the streets, she lived in sin. She was a prostitute. We Christians know better. We are never justified to lie. The Bible is clear. Lying is an abomination to God. But when a life is at stake, God wants us to protect that life. Like all the lies that were told to save the life of Moses. Lying is not the unpardonable sin. A person can confess and repent from that. But we must remember that when Rahab lied, she was not saved yet. So give her a break. James tells us that Rahab's work, not her words, her works justified her in James 2.25. She was not justified by what she said, but by what she did, her actions. The Bible does not command her deceit, it commands her faith in Hebrews 11.31. James calls her deed a work of faith. She risked her life to save the lives of the two spies because she believed in the power and the sovereignty of their God, the God of these two men. However, her days were numbered. Divine judgment was about to fall on her on her way of life, and on the entire nation of Jericho. God had already appointed the day in which he would judge them and judge her. 
the soldiers were outside around the city. Time was of the essence. God's patience with that society had been long. It lasted several hundred years, but now it was time for judgment. In verses 8 to 11, we have the confirmation of Rahab's conviction. Rahab had heard of the marvelous victories that the Lord had given the Jewish people. She had heard how their God had dried the water of the Red Sea for them. She was convinced that their God was the true God and she trusted in him. So at verse 12, we see her conversion. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. So the man answered her, our lives for yours. If none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelled on the wall. And she said to them, get to the mountain, lest the pursuer meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have re returned. Afterward, you may go your way. So the man said to her, we will be blameless of this oath of ours, of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home. So it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath, which you made us swear. Then she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. Rahab realizes that the living God of the Hebrew people was the one with whom she and all of her sinful people ultimately would have to deal with. It is a great thing when the fear of the living God falls upon a soul. Many people have been saved because of fear, and there's nothing wrong with that. The harlot begged the spies to save her and her household when they returned to destroy the city, verses 12 and 13. The spies promised to spare Rahab and her family if she hung a scarlet cord in the window of her home and if everyone remains indoor during the attack against Jericho, verse 18. That was the condition. She would be saved if she did those two things. The scarlet cord makes us think of the houses protected by the blood on the doorpost there during Passover in Exodus chapter 12. That was the faith that Rahab exercised. She did not waste one moment. She said, verse 21, according to your word, so be it. Then she sent them away and they departed. 
By faith, she bound that scarlet cord in the window. No scarlet cord in the window, no salvation. Like in Exodus, no scarlet blood on the doorpost, no salvation. Next is Rahab's confidence. Not for one moment did Rahab doubt. She displayed her scarlet cord, the outward evidence of an inward faith. Then she trusted the promises of God given to her through those two servants of him. The coming judgment was near. The soldiers were out there. Time was over for that city and those people. There was a great sound of trumpets and the walls of Jericho came down. The opportunity never came again. God knocked at the door of her home but once. We have no guarantee that he will do more than that. She did not hear the gospel a hundred times like some people did. Just like the dying thief on the cross, she heard it once and that's all she needed and she acted upon it on what she heard. The pampered and privileged children of Christian parents they grow up hearing the gospel, the truth, all of their lives, and many of them end up being gospel hardened. Not her. She jumped on the one and only opportunity that was given to her. This woman was desperate. She seized with both hands, the one and only opportunity that came her way. She believed, and that was all God expected of her. It is all he expects of us as well. There were five facts that she considered. She realized, number one, that she could not save herself. There was no place she could hide from the wrath to come. There was no way she could fight this huge army and win. She could not save herself. This is always the first thing to consider. If you can save yourself, then you don't need to accept Jesus. But the problem is we cannot save ourselves any more than she could save herself. And she realized that. She could not save herself. Number two, she realized that Jericho was totally shut up. Those in power made sure that everyone in Jericho remained in Jericho. There was nowhere to go. There was to be no contact with the enemy, no fraternizing with the people of God. Any contact was strictly forbidden. So she realized that where she was, Jericho, was totally shut up. There was no place to go. She could not save herself. There was no place to go. Number three, she realized that any thought of salvation was totally discouraged. Satan strongly opposes any thought of salvation in the mind of the convicted soul. He has many tricks at his disposal to discourage any consideration of salvation. He may threaten people with persecution. He may ridicule some with thought of salvation. Ridicule is a powerful weapon. Number four, she realized that salvation had to come from the outside. Jericho was actually cursed by God. It was doomed to destruction. Jericho could provide no help. It was far from being able to provide salvation. And she had to look outside of the city. 
And the last thing, number five, she realized that if there was any salvation, it had to come from those people, the people of God, those whom she had been taught to regard as, an, as enemies all of her life. The Hebrew people marching so confidently around the wall were the people of God. And she longed that their Savior might become her Savior too. In verses 22 to 24, while the soldiers of Jericho search for the spies, Rahab sent them to the mountain. After hiding there for three days, they escaped. They crossed the Jordan, carrying a report to Joshua, excited that the Lord had delivered these people into their hand. Verse 24. They also reported that the people were afraid because of them. Then in chapter 6, we have Rahab's convert. Verse 22 of chapter 6 says, but Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and from there bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver, the gold, the vessel of bronze, iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers from jo whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. After the miraculous victory over Jericho, Rahab was rescued. Joshua kept the promise that was made to Rahab by the two spies. He sent the same two guys to the house where the scarlet cord was hanging in the window. She and her family followed them and stayed with them. Verse 25. She had quite a strong faith. She's a brand new believer. And she asked in verse 13, save my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters. How did she know that they would want to be saved? They might not be interested to submit to the enemy and accept a new God that they did not know about. One of the brothers could have said, don't be so silly, Rahab. There is no danger. Come worse to worse, we will be their servant. Another one could have said, you are out of your mind. How can that silly little piece of scarlet cord dangling in our window save you and save us? If we are going to be saved, we must save ourselves. Let's escape over the wall. They could have said all kinds of things, but none of them made any excuses. The brothers, the sisters, the, the relatives, they were all in the same state of conviction as their sister. Somehow, by the way she lived, by her action, she was able to convince the family concerning the wrath to come. They all believed and they were saved, every one of them. They listened to Rahab and they believed her. They were brought into the camp of Israel. She brought her entire family into the family of God. Great job, Rahab. She not only put the scarlet cord in the window, she reached out to others. 
She was concerned for others. She wanted her parents, her sibling, to also be saved. Wherever they lived, they were not all living in the house of prostitution. They had their own home. She went to their house. She talked with them. She explained about the coming wrath and convinced them to come and gather into her house for the instruction of the spies. A person who is saved is concerned for the salvation of others. Look at her. She was not even saved long, and she was a soul winner. She told her family that God had provided salvation for them as well as for her. She confessed her newfound faith with her mouth. That was a dangerous thing to do. She could have been killed. It could have cost her life. And like Amram and Jochebed, the parents of Moses, she was not afraid of the authorities. So she was gathered into the ranks of God's redeemed people. She married a man named Salmon, not a fish, <laughs> and later became the mother of Boaz, who married Ruth, who had a son named Obed, who became the father of Jesse, the father of David in Ruth chapter 1, no, chapter 4. She entered the line of David, and she entered the line of the Son of God. It will be one of the joys of heaven to meet Rahab. Just don't call her a harlot. James tells us that Rahab's works, not her words, justified her. The Bible does not commend her deceit. It commends her faith. James calls her deed a work of faith. She risked her life to save the lives of the spies and later save the lives of her family members because she believed in the power and the sovereignty of their God. These people have a God that is powerful. I want to be part of this. A dead faith cannot save anybody. The letter of James confirms that. Had Rahab said that she believed in God and yet had done nothing to prove her faith, she would not have been saved. Had she not saved those two men, those two spies, had she let them be captured and killed, we would not have her story. It would not be in the Bible. She would have been killed like the rest of those in the city. Rahab is an example of faith proven by works. Fear is an acceptable reason to accept salvation. People accept the Lord and they are saved because they are afraid of the big coming judgment on this earth, the great tribulation, or they are afraid of the great judgment before they go to hell. Rahab was saved because of fear. Many people have called on the name of the Lord and have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior because they were afraid of damnation, afraid of hell. Jude, verse 23 says, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Nobody can save himself. Rahab realized that she could not save herself. So she accepted the plan of salvation provided by the God of those Hebrews. No one can save himself. Everyone needs to call on the name of the Lord, we are told in Romans 10, 13. What a story. 
We do not know how old the woman was. We do not know how long she was a harlot. We do not know why she was a harlot. Maybe there was no other way for her to survive. Still, we cannot judge her nor condemn her. Many of us have done terrible things before we were saved. Those things do not identify us now. They have passed away. They are dead. Thank God for 2 Corinthians 5.17, which says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So the worst prostitute is a virgin woman in the eyes of God. Ephesians 4.28 says, Let him who stole steal no longer. Many of us have taken stuff. We all stole something. And we are told here, stole no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hand what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. So if you were a thief in your back old days, you were told by God, you don't have to make restitution, but you have to give to some people in need. Not to mention the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery in John chapter 8. I always wonder how in the world she was caught in the very act. Anyway, so Jesus said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no, Lord. And he said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go, sin no more. That is the key. Sin no more. Person who is saved, sin no more. We do not know the rest of the story. But had this woman continued in adultery, that woman that Jesus said, Jesus would have had to condemn her. Repentance is required for forgiveness. You will not obtain forgiveness. It is not obtainable without first repenting, turning from it. Had Rahab continued to be a harlot, she would have been kicked out of the camp of the Israel and would never have made it into the line of Jesus. But she repented. She turned from that life. Learn from Rahab that no matter what your past may be, you can still be forgiven and be accepted by God like she was. Whatever you have done before starting a relationship with God does not count. It is dead. It has passed away. When you accept Jesus, you start fresh, brand new. Everything prior to that new relationship is not important. It is gone. I learned that lesson the hard way. After I was saved, I had a desire to be a pastor. But the church that I attended told me I would never be a pastor because I was divorced in 1974, five years before I was born again. And they said, had I murdered my wife, it'd be okay. <laughs> my jail sentence would have paid my debt to society. Something was fishy with that church. And that's when I went to Calvary Chapel, Napa, and they shown me 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Praise the Lord for 2 Corinthians. We serve a glorious God. We serve a merciful God. He loves us. He is willing to overlook any sin, any sin, if we repent. Jesus paid the price with his blood for all of our sin. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Jesus. So remember that faith is not something that is vocalized. It is not something that is articulated. It is something that is lived. It is something that is proved by your action, your behavior, not your words. A faith that cannot change your behavior will not change your destiny. Next week, we'll continue in the book of Joshua with the story of a thief this time. The poor guy, he paid a terrible price for not being able to resist the temptation and taking what God had said not to take. So next week, the story of a man named Elkan. We do not know how old Rahab was, nor how long she was a prostitute. She had siblings, she had brothers, sisters. They knew what she was. They knew the house where she lived was filled with men coming in and coming out. They knew she was a prostitute. Imagine them receiving a visit from that prostitute to offer them salvation. It would have been tempting for the sibling to say, get out of my house. I know what you do for a living. I know how you live, and you're going to talk to me about God of the Jews? Somehow, they believed her. She was sinless. She really wanted them to be saved. And they believed her, and they agreed to go to her house and to wait for that day when they are going to be protected and taken out, taken into the camp of Israel. That's something for a brand new believer. I know believers who've been saved for 30 years, and they don't have the guts that she had to talk to others about Jesus, especially not their family. It is important. The person who is saved is always concerned with the rest of the family and also concerned with others to be saved. They want others to have what they have. Rahab wanted her family to have what she had. And she did not have it yet. She was just promised by two guys that we're going to save you. And she believed it. She believed those two guys. And she ran with it and convinced her family, and they were all saved. What a girl. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. May he bless your life, your home, your family. And may you, like Rahab, have the boldness to share with others what the Lord has done for you, for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.